All right. Double check that. We are recording. OK. Uh, oh, perfect. You guys have already started the attendance. Yeah, if you're here, please type here in the chat so that I, that can be recorded. Um, let's see. I am still in the process of grading the uh, group projects. That is taking a little bit longer than I anticipated, but I should be finished by tonight. So those grades should be uploaded by tonight. Um, and I will be probably also tonight, I'll be creating the uh, group projects for, or not the projects, the groups for project two. Um, so it, I, I don't think I said this last class, let me say it now. Uh, if you want to work alone on the, on the uh, second group project, that is fine. You still have to do the entire project, but you can work alone if you want. Um, just send me an email tonight uh, to know uh, to let me know if you want to work alone, so I can put you in a solo group. Um, anyone that that does, that's fine. I'll put you in a solo group. The rest, I will have um, Web Campus generate random groups. I think for this next project, we'll have four to five uh, people per group because it's a little bit more um, a little bit more work than than the first project. Um, so, uh, so yeah, if, if you do want to work solo, that again, that's fine. And we'll, I think, um, we'll have a little bit of time at the end of the class today and we'll go over quickly what we're doing for, for uh, project two. So you'll be able to see that um, and have an idea of, of whether you can work on it alone or if you want to work on it alone. Um, but just, just, um, Keep in mind, if you do want to work alone, then you'll have to let me know uh, as soon as possible. Um, any questions, comments? Um, I've been noticing in reading the, the chapter four, particularly, there's a lot of, of extra information about using Excel. And it, it, it was too mind boggling for me. So I kind of finally started skipping over a lot of that. Do we have to know how to use that Excel? Uh, no. Um, so there, there is. Uh, you, you don't. You don't have to. Um, there is a lot of a lot of that in 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 the chapter for sure. Um, Excel is definitely. Let me let me think of how I want to state this. It's definitely useful, and it can do a lot of the things that we are doing for Chapter Four. Um, but uh, for our purposes, we're using StackCrunch instead. Um, and so mostly I want you guys to focus on StackCrunch. The, uh, the information there for Excel would be for either um, uh, classes that aren't using the Pearson online homework because the, the, uh, the, the Pearson online account comes with StackCrunch. So if you're not using that, you don't have StackCrunch. So instead you would use Excel. Um, or is also for uh, if you are going to be doing this sort of thing in the future, and don't want to pay for StackCrunch, then you could use Excel as well. Um, so that that information is is useful in in those situations, uh, but we're not going to be using Excel in this course, and I won't be testing on that. Yeah. So um, that information you don't need to know. Um, you can skim through it or skip over it. Uh, either way, wh whatever is is best for your personal studies. Hey, uh, we have not been taught to use Stack crunch either so um yeah we will be using actually so um i have never even heard of that before so. <laughs> right we're, we're actually so stack crunch we're going to be using uh starting to use today uh and most of that we'll be using for statistics which uh chapter five is on statistics and um i think a lot of the if, if i recall going back to to chapter four. Chapter four was the budget stuff. I, I, I always get that. I always get the, the order confused in my head. Um, for chapter four, we actually don't need to use StackCrunch, um, even though it can do the same things as Excel, uh, because of what we are focusing on with the, uh, with the exams and the homework. We're mostly focusing on the formulas, not necessarily the individual singular steps. Um, we had, I think that was uh, one homework assignment from chapter four, where we went through the um, 
how much of the first payment goes to towards the interest and how much to the principal and then for the second payment and the third payment. Uh, but for the most part, we're just using the, the formula. So we don't need Excel for, for chapter four. We will need it for a chapter seven for sure. So we're going to start. Uh, so yeah, I, I apologize. My, my brain makes that up. We're going to start looking at stack crunch today and I, I will show you how to find that um, on Pearson. And we're going to actually uh, for this coming mini project is going to also be an intro to stack crunch. So um, any other questions, comments? I'm wondering why you're making the group projects uh, so involved because you said it didn't take that work, but it took a, a lot, a lot, a lot of work to do the last one and uh, a lot of time and a lot of stress. And we've already got a whole lot with the, you know, homework assignments, the reading and the reading checks. It takes a long time to plow through the math reading and we mm. have, you know, other classes and we have these mini tests and then we have the tests, you know, and to have this projects on top of it is just a, it's a big pile on. It feels like a lot of busy work. And so it'd be nice if you made it a little less work rather than more work, if you know what I mean. Um, yeah, okay. Um, I will, I'll take that into consideration. I'll take a look at the uh, second project and see if I can uh, see what I can do to make that a little less work. That that's that's not a bad suggestion. Um, yeah, let me let me. Um, I guess we'll after after lecture today we'll go through what is currently set for the, for the project, and then I will go through and see if uh, see if there's anything that I can uh, cut out of this next one to to make it a little less work for you guys. Um, it's definitely, I don't want you guys to be overwhelmed. Um, the The homework is pretty important, and I, I think the, the projects are fairly important as well, uh, just in that they test the information, but um, I don't want you guys to be too overwhelmed. So I'll I'll take a look at the second project and see if there's see if there's any adjustments that I can make to make it a little bit easier to work with. Um, any other questions or comments? Okay. Uh, I'm not seeing any questions in the chat, so I'll answer those as they come along. Um, but if there are no other questions, let's go ahead and jump into the material. So let me find the right window here. Here we are. And let me bring back the chat. Whenever I switch screens or switch to sharing screens, I lose the chat. There it is. Okay. Um, so let's go ahead and get started then for the with the material. Um, so chapter five is where we are at currently, uh, starting chapter five today. Um, so chapter five is on statistical reasoning. And we're going to be looking at uh, two sections. Um, so we have uh, section 5C and 5E. And they're not going to, there's not going to be any uh, extra reading or reading checks on chapter five. It'll just be those two that we uh, lecture on will be the, and homework will be also the reading checks. Uh, so chapter five is kind of an, uh, an intro to some of the basic statistical information we'll be using. Uh, and we're also going to have, so here we'll also have uh, an intro to StatCrunch. Because StatCrunch is mostly used for statistics. Um, and that's that's what we are starting to get into currently with this with this chapter five. Uh, so 5C then, uh, 5C, we are looking at statistical tables and graphs. So for, for this one again, we're going to uh, have a basic introduction to 
um, to some statistical concepts that we'll be using in chapter five, a little bit more in chapter six, but um, let's start off with uh, frequency. So in a study or a survey, the frequency of a category or variable, uh, category, sorry, let's, yeah, or variable, Uh, no, we don't need the variable part. Let's just let's just keep it as category of a category. Is the um, okay? Having a few technical difficulties. Sorry. There we go. Uh, is the total number um, of data points? for that category. So an example of this, and we'll, we'll see a, a more concrete example after we go over these, these first few definitions. Um, take, for example, if we're looking at a study to determine eye color. Uh, so we have eye color could be blue eyes, brown eyes, uh, green eyes, hazel eyes. Um, for each one of those categories, so for like blue eyes, we would count the number of individuals in the study that that had blue eyes, that would be the frequency of blue eyes in that study. Or, you know, for brown eyes, we count the total number of people that had brown eyes, that would be the, the frequency for, for that category, for the category of brown eyes in that study. And um, we often want to be able to uh, easily see what the frequency is for, for categories. In a, in a survey or study. So a lot of times we'll use a frequency table. So a frequency table requires two columns. And oftentimes we will have more than just the two columns. But a, a basic frequency table, we need two columns. Um, we need the categories of the data and the frequency of each category. So um, basically a frequency table will be a way to uh, quickly and visually display the frequency of each category that we are interested in from, from the study. Uh, so we need the categories and we need the frequency. Um, we can add more information and a lot of times we do. For, for this textbook, we're actually going to be adding, um, this textbook, they like to add two more columns to that, uh, which we'll talk about in, in just a moment. Um, so we, we will be looking at, uh, we can add more information to a frequency table as needed, depending on what information we are looking for, what information we're trying to display. Um, for our purposes, we're going to add two more columns. Uh, one will be the relative frequency. So the relative frequency, let's capitalize that, relative frequency of any category is the percentage or fraction of the data values that fall into that category. So again, when you see that word relative, you should think uh, percentage. So here, when we're talking about the relative frequency, that is going to be the percent of individuals in that study that fall into that category. And so we have the, the equation, the relative frequency is going to be equal to the frequency in the category divided by the total number of data points. Uh, where the data points, um, each one corresponds with, uh, with an individual person in the study. So if you had 50 people take a, a study, 
or the survey, then there will be 50 data points. And if you're looking for the relative frequency of, of blue eyes, you'd say, well, this percent of individuals in the study or the survey had, had blue eyes. And the way we find that percent is the frequency of that, of that category divided by the total number of data points, the total number of people that were in, this, in the study. And the next thing that we're going to add, uh, the next thing that the authors like to add to our frequency tables is the cumulative frequency. So the cumulative frequency is the total number of data points up to and including that category uh, in the frequency table. So the cumulative frequency is basically going to be a running total of how many data, data points, how many uh, data points have been accounted for in our frequency table up to that point. Okay, so just, just as, a, as a quick quick review then. So uh, frequency is the total number of data points in a given category. So if we're looking at, take for example, a study where we are uh, looking at eye color, then the categories would be, or the categories for that variable would be blue eyes, brown eyes, hazel eyes, and so on. And so then the frequency would be the total number of data points, the total number of people that answered for that category. So blue eyes, let's say there were 20 in a survey of 50, then that would be uh, 20 would be the frequency. Uh, in a frequency table, you have to have at least two columns. You need the category and the frequency. It can be um, sometimes they use relative frequency depending on the textbook. Our textbook, we're going to have all four, but uh, we can use uh, sometimes here the relative frequency instead. Uh, but a frequency table requires at least two columns. You need the uh, category because that's what you are interested in. That's how that's those are the uh, possible answers of the questions in the study of the, the uh, possible answers for a variable like eye color. So categories, blue eyes, brown eyes, hazel eyes. Um, and then either frequency or relative frequency. Uh, but we can add more columns. So this book, uh, this book we use four columns for a frequency table. Whoops. For a frequency table. We're going to have the category we're going to have the frequency. So how many people fall into that category or how many things fall into that category if we're looking at a study that, is, that does not involve people. Uh, relative frequency, so what is the percentage? Although a lot of times that is uh, kept as a fraction, kept in its fraction form. Um, so let's take for example, 20 out of 50 instead of the percentage. And then the textbook likes to add cumulative frequency as a way to uh, double check the table. And we'll see that as we go along. Okay, so um, let's look at an example for this. So we'll, we'll look at a, at a concrete example where we're looking at um, frequency of, of various categories in a study. We'll create a, a frequency table and then we'll look at some alternative ways to display the information of frequency. Okay, so let's get a fresh page here. And for this example, we want to create a frequency table. So for this example, let's create a frequency table using the four columns above. So we're going to use the four columns that the book uses, the category, frequency, relative frequency, and cumulative frequency for the following hypothetical data set. 
And the data set that we're going to look at are final grades in a course. So frequency is uh, can be used a lot um, to analyze data. So uh, take, for example, if you are teaching a course, one thing that your um, supervisor might want to know is, well, what were the grades, what was, what was the grade breakdown of the students in the course? How many students got A, how many students got B, and so on. Uh, so usually when you are starting out with this, you'll, be ha you'll have the raw data, and then you'll want to create a frequency table to more easily see what's, what's going on, to see the big picture. So um, for this example, we're given the raw data. So let's uh, record that. So we have a B, we have a B, an A, a C, a C, an F, a D, another C, another C, and a B. Going to have uh, two more columns, oh, sorry, two more rows of data. So uh, for the second row, we have a C, an F, a B, an F, a C, an A, two more Cs, an F, and an A. And then for our last row, we'll have a B, a D, a C, uh, four more Cs, a B, two Fs, and a D. Okay. So um, let's say you were teaching a course and your supervisor wants to know a breakdown of the data, uh, how many students got an A, how many students got a B, and so on. So uh, this is what you would have for the raw data. You would, you would have, um, you'd, you'd determine what, what were the grades. In this case, we have 30 students in the course. So uh, maybe let's make a note of that. Note there are 30 students. 10 in each row, so that is uh, 30 data points that we're looking at here. And if we were to just give our uh, our supervisor this this uh, raw information, that would that would not really go over well. Uh, they probably send it back and say, "Hey, we want you know want this more in a in an analyzed way." So let's go ahead and start our our. Uh, frequency table uh, to see how that that helps to organize our data. So we're going to have first our categories. Uh, then we'll have the frequency for each category. Then we will have the relative frequency. And our last column, we will have the cumulative frequency. Okay. Now again, depending on the context, we could have different columns, depending on the information that we need. Uh, but for the purposes of this course, uh, these these are this, this is the information that we need. Um, so what are the categories that we have? Let me uh, let me ask that to see how we are how we're doing. What are the categories for this data set? Would that be A, B, C, D, e, uh, D, and F? Yep, that's exactly right. So the categories here are the possible answers, or I guess uh, possible. Um, yeah, if, if this was a survey, the pos the the answers. So what what grade did you get? A, B, C. D or F. So we have A, we have B, we have C, D, and F. Very good. Okay. So then for each one of these, we'll just start with A. We're going to go through, we're going to first determine the frequency. So what is the total number? Then the relative frequency and uh, the cumulative frequency. So if we start with A, we can go through and count the number of A's that we have in the class. So it looks like we have uh, one A here in the first row, uh, two here in the second, so that's three, and no in the th none in the third, so that's three for our frequency. And for our relative frequency, then we have 30 data points, we have 30 students, so that is three out of 30 
or if we want that as a percent, that would be 10%. So we take the three divided by 30, that is 0.1 and then times 100 gives us our 10%. And the cumulative frequency is how many data points we've looked at so far. So um, for, the first, for the first row, it's always going to be the same number as the frequency. We looked at three data points for A. Okay, so there is our, our first row. Uh, first row in the in the frequency table. Next, let's look at bees. So we want to again count the number of bees we have in the class. So it looks like we have uh, one, two, three bees in the first row, uh, another one in row two, and another two in row three. So we have six total bees. So the relative frequency, that's six out of 30, or a 20%. And so for the cumulative frequency, we found six Bs and there were three As. So we've looked at a total of nine uh, students, six that had As, three that had Bs. So our cumulative is the uh, what we found in this row, six, plus what we had from the previous one, three. So that's nine. All right, let's continue. Let's look at C's next. So we have one, two, three, four C's in the first row. Uh, another one, two, three, four in the second. And it looks like another four here in the third. So we have a total of 12 Cs. So our frequency is going to be 12 out of 30, or if we have that in our percent form, that is 40%. And what would be our cumulative frequency now? 21. 21, good, because we had nine before, nine from the first two rows, and 12 this time, so we have 21 as our cumulative frequency. Very good. Okay, uh, let's go ahead and finish this out then. Let's look at the uh, Ds next. So for the first row, we have one D. Uh, second row, it doesn't look like we have any Ds. Third row, we have two Ds. So in total, we have three Ds. So that's three out of 30 or again, 10%. Now, when you are, uh, let me just make make this point. Um, when you're doing a frequency table, generally you will stick with one or the other. You, you usually won't put both the fraction and the percent. So usually you'll stick to one or the other. So you'd have just the three out of 30, six out of 30, 12 out of 30, or you'll just have the, the percents, 10%, 20%, 40%. Um, okay. So that was uh, our relative frequency for D. So the cumulative frequency we've looked at now, 24 data points, three uh, that were Ds and 21 from before. And what we have left are the Fs. So if we look at the Fs, we have uh, one F on the first row, two, it looks like three in the second and two in the third. So we have a total of six Fs in our data sets, that's six. So we have six out of 30 or 20%. And now our cumulative frequency, we had 24 before, we have six Fs, so that is 30. Now, this is, uh, this is why the textbook likes to include the cumulative frequency. This number, the, the number for the cumulative frequency in the very last row, this should match the number of data points. So in this case, we had 30 students. So by the end of our frequency table, if we, if we have the cumulative frequency column, that number at the end should match what we had, the number of data points we had. Uh, so in this case, it does. So that's a way that we can use to, um, to check our numbers. Okay, so this is our frequency table for this raw data that we had. And this gives us a lot of good information. This, is, this, would, be, this would be more what the, uh, what the supervisor would be looking for, like 10% of students got a, 
20% of students got the lot easier to uh, digest the information when, when we've analyzed it in this way. Um, yeah, but wouldn't it be bad to have that many students getting Fs and Ds? I mean, particularly the Fs, six students out of 30 getting Fs, doesn't that a sign that, that the class isn't that well taught if that many people were failing it? It could be, uh, which is why the supervisor would want the, the data, would want the, the numbers for sure. Yep. Um, another way you could look at it is uh well i guess it depends on <laughs> it depends on the the school the supervisor the subject uh and the teacher and it might also depend on um what what would be other factors that could affect it uh is it just the one class or is it all of the that instructor's classes that are this way um so so that would that would uh, kind of go into the next the next bit um analyzing the data further but uh, for now we're just looking at setting up the table that, that that's uh, those are good good questions comments um, another thing we could look at then how many students how many students passed if we look at if we consider passing being C or above C B or a then what percentage of students passed What if, would it be 70%? It would be 70%. Yep. Because 40% got C, 20% got B, and 10% got A. So 70% of students passed. And that might be another another way to look at another uh, important um, part of the data to look at, which again, 70% might be really low, depending on uh, the institution that you're looking at. So that might be uh, cause to look at the instructor a little bit closely and and see uh, if there's a reason why that is. If that's a common occurrence for that instructor, it might be uh, might be a sign that you might need to. A anyways, <laughs> that's getting a little bit deeper in, into that. Um, so that's creating the frequency table. Uh, next. We have a, a couple of other ways that we can display this information besides just using a table. Uh, there are more graphical ways that we can display this information. Uh, let me move to the text tool here. So we can, we can also display the frequency information from a data set using a bar or a line graph which um, in this course, we're usually going to be using a histogram. So usually a histogram in this course, that's what we'll usually be sticking to, which is a, a type of, of bar graph um, or a pie chart. Those are, the, uh, those are the big ones that we're going to be using in this course to display this information. So we can use a bar or line graph, which we'll usually stick with a histogram or a pie chart. And so uh, what those would look like, and for this you probably already know, but let's let's look at what they would look like. So if we are using a histogram, which is a type of, of bar graph, we would have our categories here. So we'd have A, B, C, uh, D, and F. And I see a question in chat. Let me just write that, okay. Uh, a pie chart, uh, yes, actually, that is that is why, uh, so we would use a, a pie chart because that has to do with percentages. So it would be a way to display uh, the information broken down by, by percentage. Very good. Um, let's, let's go ahead and finish this one. So uh, in this particular example, each one of these is uh, multiple of three. So let's uh, look at three. Here we'll have six, nine, and 12. So we had uh, three A's. We had six B's. Okay. Uh, we had 12 C's. OK. 
okay, uh, three Ds. and six Fs. So here would be our histogram. Oh, oh, sorry, I misunderstood the question. Um, do we use a pie chart or it doesn't matter which graph we use? So usually, uh, well, <laughs> that's, that's a good question. Um, usually in a, in a professional uh, setting, you would probably be told by your supervisor what, what type of chart they're looking for, whether it would be a histogram or some other bar or line graph or a pie chart in particular. Um, in this one, we'll be using probably the histograms more often than not, because the histograms, uh, if you have if you have a small number of raw data, so let's say 30, 30 uh, data points or less, then you can fairly easily draw a, a histogram or a, or a bar line graph by hand. Uh, but drawing a pie chart by hand is, is not, that's not something that we would do. Um, so in that case, we would use a different tool. So in this case, uh, for, for our purposes, we would use StackCrunch to create a pie chart instead. Um, so that, that depends on the context. Um, I think for this class, most of the time we'll be just focusing on the histogram on the bar line graph. So here is our histogram. I don't think if I if I remember correctly, I don't think there are too many at all that will use the pie chart. All right, let me and fix that. So for a pie chart, again, you you probably already know what this looks like. You'd have the each uh, you'd have the center of the of the circle here, and you'd say, well, ten percent here got A, twenty percent got B, and so on. But again, very very difficult to do by hand. I think for some of the questions, the pie chart is given. Um, and then from there, you, you answer questions. But yeah, usually we'll be, usually we'll be sticking with uh, histogram uh, just because just it's easier to, uh, to create by hand, especially when we have uh, small, small data sets. OK, uh, let's go to. The next thing that we have, um, in some studies and some some particular cases, it's not always easy, or it's not always uh, strategically best to use every single possible data point, uh, every single possible category. In which case, we will uh, do what is called binning data. So for a data set that has a large number of possible values, we will often bin the data, that is uh, group the data by uh, close values and and that word close I'm putting in quotes because that depends on the context of the of the data uh, for some for some data uh, close might be within 10 values whereas for our other data that might not be close at all so that's what we call binning the data we group the data by certain close values an example of this would be if we're looking at uh, salary made per year. So uh, yearly salary. So here we might bend the data, let's say, in groups of 2000. So we would look at instead of saying how many got zero, uh, how many got one, how many got two, we'd say uh, how many got zero to 1999. And we'd use that as a category instead. So that would be a bin 
of the data. Our second bin would be 2000 to 2999, uh, sorry, not two, 3999. The next one would be from 4000 to uh, 5999, and so on. So instead of looking at every single possible value, instead we bend the data together. We look at uh, data that is close together, uh, whatever close is for our context. Um, so that you'll have to figure out by the data itself. So in this case, salary 2000 might be pretty close, depending on a lot closer than, let's say, going by 10. So 0 to 10, 10 to 20, and so on. So here, we say that the bin size is 2000. All right, let me fix that. There we go. And there will be some examples here where we will bend the data together. Um, but for some of these, like with the with the other ones, A, B, C, D, and F, uh, since we only have five categories, we can just uh, keep those categories as they are. All right. The last part of the section is looking at data types. So we can look at, um, for, for a survey or study, we can look at what are the different data types that we have. And, and that, we'll, we'll look at two different types. We can probably classify it in many different other ways, but for this one, we want to look at two data types. So we have quantitative data is data that represents a quantity or number. Uh, so a value that can be counted or measured. So an example of that, an example of quantitative data would be something like weight or height, uh, something that gives you a number. So you'll notice that for uh, quantitative data, the, uh, the root word for quant quantitative is quantity, which means number. So um, quantitative data, looking at things like what are, what are actual numbers. So an example of this would be uh, height or weight, or for looking at say more, uh, physics or engineering based study temperature. I see a hand. Yes, question. I was going to ask, um, could age be an example of that? Uh, yes, very good. Age would also be a quantitative data type because age is a number. So you'd have, well, age, uh, you know, whatever the, whatever the value is for that. Very good. Age is also fits into there. Then the second type is a type uh, that we cannot represent as a number, which we call qualitative data, is data that cannot be represented by a number. And so an example of this or maybe a couple of examples of this would be things like uh, ice cream flavor. We can't really represent vanilla as a, as a number uh, or maybe said in, the, in a better way, there is no number that is commonly accepted to represent vanilla. You can't say, well, uh, my favorite type of ice cream is seven and everyone thinks that that's vanilla. That, that's not how that works. So this would be qualitative. Uh, or eye color. Uh, data types that we cannot represent as a number. 
so that we have to have actual value, uh, actual uh, non-numerical values for. So let's look at it, maybe a couple of examples here. Um, so what data type are the following? Let's look at the first one. Let's look at uh, annual salary. And the second one, let's look at uh, soda pop flavor. Okay, so let's start with uh, annual salary. What type of data, uh, what, what is the data type for that? Is it quantitative or qualitative? Quantitative. Quantitative, good, why? Because it, it represents a quantity of a number. Right, because you're going to be, your answer is going to be a number, good. What about soda pop flavor? Qualitative. Qualitative, why? Because it, uh, it's not numerical, it's not numerically re uh, represented, it's one. very. Very good. Yeah, it's it's it cannot be represented by a number. It's not numeric. It's uh, not a numerical answer. Very good. Okay. Uh, so that is section five e uh, c. Sorry, five c. So five c. We have a basic introduction to um, a few statistical concepts. One is uh, well, I guess the last one we talked about was the data type, and then uh, frequency of a category. Uh, as well as relative frequency, which again, that uh, we have the word relative there, so you should think percent um, and the different ways to represent frequency, uh, most of which usually will use will include a frequency table, and then we can use a more graphical representation, um, a bar line graph or a pie chart, something like that, usually a, hist a histogram, it's a type of bar, of bar chart. Okay. And the last section we have, so again, for chapter five, we only have two sections. We have uh, section 5C and the last section is 5E. And this one is a little bit shorter in the concepts that we will be testing on. So 5E is on correlation and causality. Although uh, we're going to mostly be focusing on the correlation aspect and not causality, we will um, we will talk a little bit about causality, uh, but mostly we'll will uh, be focused on correlation. Okay, so uh, first thing we need to do is define what do we mean by correlation, and then we can look at some examples. So a correlation exists between two variables when higher values of one are consistently associated with higher values, uh, higher or lower values of the other. So an example of this would be uh, height and weight. There is a correlation between a person's height and their weight. Because uh, generally, and again, there, there can be exceptions when we're talking about correlation, but in general, as a person's height increases, their weight increases. So um, there's correlation between those two variables, between height and weight, uh, because as one increases, the other tends to increase. All right, so let, let's um, underline the important bits. Correlation is what we defined. And we are looking at correlation between two variables. So in this example, we're looking at correlation between height and weight. Those are our two variables. And here we said uh, taller people 
tend to weigh more. So there is a correlation there. Uh, and again, the uh, one of the important words there is tend. There can will be exceptions to the rule whenever we're talking about correlation, uh, but uh, by and large, uh, as as uh, we're looking at individuals that are taller, those individuals will weigh more. Now we're going to use a graphical representation um, again for when we are analyzing correlation called a scatter plot. Um, so a scatter plot is a graph where each point represents the two values uh, let's let's get rid of that. Uh, the values of the two variables and is used to analyze correlation. So an example of a scatter plot, if we're going on with this previous example, uh, height and weight, then we would have one of the variables, on one axis and one of the variables on the other. So here we would say is height. So we'd have uh, an individual's height and here we would have say weight. So we'd have, um, let's say this person is five foot, this person is uh, six foot and so on. And we have their weight as well here. And so each point we uh, for each individual, we, they would have two answers for this survey. They'd have, what is your height? They'd have a numerical value. So we can graph that here on the x-axis. And what is your weight? And we can graph that on our y-axis. And when we graph uh, all of the data points that we get, then we get something that would look like this. So this is an example of a scatter plot. And uh, we're going to look at a couple of examples from the textbook. So in the textbook on page 357, we will look at figure uh, 5.39 and figure 5.40. Okay. So let's take a quick look there at the textbook. So I've pulled up the page for that. So here are the two figures. This is page three, 357. So this one here on the left, this is figure uh, 5.39. And so this is a scatter plot for diamond uh, weights and prices. So again, each dot here represents a single diamond. Uh, the X value is its weight and the Y diamond, uh, <laughs> and the Y value is the diamond's price. So the X value is the diamond's weight. The Y value is the diamond's price. Uh, so here we, we can see um, are the data values for, for comparing these two variables of a diamond. Uh, the second one, section 5.40, 5.40, we're looking at a scatter, a scatter plot of life expectancy and infant mortality of countries. I think those are averages, average life expectancy, average infant mortality. Um, and so each one here, each uh, country has been, has been labeled. Um, but you can see that the X, uh, the X value here is the life expectancy in years. And the uh, Y value here is the infant mortality. And this one is measured in uh, deaths per 1,000 live births. Okay, and we'll we'll analyze this a little bit further, but I did want to show some better examples uh, of scatter plots. Um, that is a good question. In order for two categories to ca uh, correlate, they both have to have to be quantitative. I'm going to say in this class, yes. In general, 
in general, you could probably uh, come up with a correlation between things that are not quantitative, but we want to keep things a little bit, a little bit uh, easier. So in this course, yes, we'll 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 just stick in this course. We'll just stick with the uh, with looking at quantitative uh, variables uh, just to keep things easy. Yes. Okay. Um, so we'll we'll come back to these two uh, scatter plots in just a moment after this next next part. So. Um, and I do want to mention here also uh, for for this section for section five e, uh, we'll be we'll be providing you with the with the scatter plots. You won't have to be creating those. So um, this one you'll be given a scatter plot. And you'll be asked to analyze it from there. So just just to hopefully put your mind at ease on that. You won't have to create your own. Okay. Uh, let's go to a fresh page. So there are a couple of things we can talk about in terms of correlation. And the first thing we wanna talk about is types of correlation. So there are three types of correlation. The first is positive correlation. And if, if two variables are positively correlated, if there is a positive correlation between two variables, then both variables tend to increase together. So as one variable increases, the other increases as well. If we were to graph this, look at a potential scatter plot for this, then as one increases, the other tends to increase. So it would look something like this. So if we were to find um, a line that best fits the data, uh, that fits as much of the data as we can. It would look something like this. The line would be going, if we go from left to right, the line would be going up. So that is our positive correlation. What we mean by a positive correlation. A negative correlation is both variables tend to change in opposite directions. So that is, as one variable increases, the other decreases. Okay, and so graphically, if we're looking at a negative correlation, as uh, one value increases, the other tends to decrease. So that would look something like this. And so again, if we were to draw the line of best fit, line that fits most of the data as well as possible, then going from left to right, the line would be decreasing, would be going down. And the third type of correlation is no correlation. So it's possible to have a positive correlation, a negative correlation, or no correlation. So with no correlation, there is no apparent relationship between the two variables. And so if we were to graph this in a scatter plot, the points would be all over the place to where we could not possibly draw a line that fits any of the data in a meaningful way, or that fits most of the data in a meaningful way. So there would be the uh, no correlation between the two variables. Okay, uh, so let's go back to the textbook, those, those two scatter plots here. And let's determine for each one of these, let's start with the uh, figure 5.39, the diamonds. Uh, we wanna determine whether the correlation is positive or negative. So with this first example here with the diamonds, is this a positive correlation or a negative correlation? I think it's positive. It's positive, good. Notice as the weight increases, so does the price. So as one variable increases, the other increases as well. What about for the second example, 
zero, the uh, life expectancy versus death rate per country. Is this a positive or negative correlation? It's negative. A negative too. Negative, very good. Because as one increases, the other decreases. So as life expectancy increases, the infant mortality decreases. Very good. So here is an example of a positive correlation. Here's an example of a negative correlation. Um, I think there was one more. Let me see here. One thing that I wanted to mention with that, I think it's, let me find the right page in the book. So on page 539, let's go there really quickly. Ah, yeah, so here they're, they're using Excel, but um, this will be this will be given to us. So again, we're not we're not going to be asked to create the scatter plots. The scatter plots will be provided. So you'll notice right here. Now they have uh, provided the line of best fit or the uh, the line that fits most of the data as best as it can, and that will also usually be included. So here it looks like it's the diamond prices and weights, and it's a lot easier to tell when you have the line. You can see that this one is a positive correlation. So as one variable increases, the other increases as well. Okay. So you have types of, of correlation. Uh, the next thing that we can talk about when we're looking at a correlation between variables is the strength of a correlation, of the correlation. Uh, so let's look at that next. So strength of the correlation. So we say the more closely the variables follow the general trend, the stronger the correlation. And so what you mean here by this, if we were looking at this graphically, we'll have a, we'll have a better way to analyze it besides just graphically. But if we were to look at this graphically, if we have, uh, let's look at a positive correlation So let's say we have some data points here. If the data points are closer together here, uh, are more tight, tight, tightly together, are um, getting closer to a singular straight line, then this is a strong correlation. So data points are close means we have a strong correlation. Uh, if the data points start to not be as close together, if uh, we have to look at a wider range here, then that is a weaker correlation. So the points farther apart, then the weaker it is. And I see a hand, yes? I was wondering if um, even though it's farther apart, would it, and even though it's a weak um, cor correlation, would it still be a positive correlation? Yes, yeah. very good. Um, so if the, if the points were, if it was going down, then it would be a, a negative correlation. So it'd be weak or strong. So when you, that's a good question. Um, so when we're looking at a correlation, you're going to, so I'll give you uh, a scatter plot. And generally, there will be a correlation because you because we want to test test that. Um, so the the question would be, is the correlation positive or negative? And then is the correlation strong or weak? And so you could have a a strong positive correlation. You could have a strong, negative correlation, a, uh, a weak positive correlation, or a weak negative correlation. Yeah, so it can go uh, either way, strong or weak, uh, positive or negative. OK. 
Okay. Um, in a perfect correlation, all of the data points lie on a straight line. Um, so if there is a perfect correlation between the variables, whenever we graph the points, it will always lie on just a single line. It will always be just a singular straight line. Nothing will be off of the line. Um, that will almost never happen in nature when we're looking at two variables, um, but that is what we call a perfect correlation. Um, now, there is a way, uh, a better way to analyze um, the strength of correlation. And this, this little bit, uh, I'm going to talk about it, the correlation coefficient. This little bit is not in the textbook, unfortunately. But we will be providing that. So um, the correlation coefficient, which will represent uh, by the variable r, is a number between negative 1 and 1 and represents the strength of a correlation. Now, um, I, I generally don't like to state it this way because this is not exactly correct. Um, but for the purposes of this course, since we're not really getting too much into, into statistics, it'll work for, for our purposes. Um, so without getting, getting too far into it, uh, you can think of the correlation coefficient. You can think of R as representing the percent of correlation. So um, if we had, uh, say, r equals 0 0.75, we can think of that as that there is a 75% correlation between the two variables. Now, again, that's an oversimplification. I don't think you will ever see it explained in that way in any textbook. But for our purposes, that will, that will work. And so if you have something like uh, R equals 0 0.13, that would be, you want to think of that as a 13% correlation um, between the two variables, so not very high. So the higher the number R, the stronger the correlation. And, and uh, the positive just means it's positively correlated, the negative means it's negatively correlated. So the way that we uh, will analyze that is uh, for this course, You want to think of uh, between zero and zero point five, or zero and negative zero point five. So then, uh, we're thinking of in the first place a correlation from zero percent to fifty percent, or from a neg uh, in the second one when it's negative, a negative correlation between zero and fifty percent. We want to think of this as a weak correlation. Whereas if it is between 0 0.5 and 1, or if we're looking at a negative correlation, negative 0 0.5 and negative 1, then we think of that as a strong correlation. And so again, um, probably won't see this explained this way in any statistics course, but we think of our we can think of R in this course as a percentage uh, representing the strength of the correlation. So 100%, that would be a perfect correlation. So maybe we should write that um, for R equals one would be a perfect as soon as my program catches up, perfect positive correlation. And for R equals negative one would be a perfect negative correlation. And if R equals zero, then there is no correlation. 0% correlated, no correlation. 
Okay. Um, now to help out with this, uh, for for the exam, you will probably be given a scatter plot. It will have the the line of best fit, and it will have the correlation coefficient. So R will be given. Uh, to kind of help summarize with that, if we go to um, Web Campus, we go to Student View. Oh, sorry, I see. I think I see a hand in chat. Is there a question? Scroll down to. Oh, it went away. Okay, it's probably left over. Uh, I uploaded this uh, PDF correlation coefficient. So I borrowed this image from uh, from statistics. Uh, so this shows some examples of different R values for different scatter plots. So R equals zero here. You'll see that there is no correlation. The points are all over the place. R equals 0 0.3. That's a pretty weak correlation. Points are pretty spread out. Uh, whereas here, R equals 0 0.7. Points are much closer together. And if we look uh, a little bit further here are the negative values of R. So negative 0 0.7. Again, the points are pretty close together, but it's negative, so it's a negative correlation. As one variable increases, the other decreases. And then uh, just a summary of the coefficient here. So the book, unfortunately, does not give the correlation coefficient, but we will. And um, so let's, let, me, let me just ask this really quickly then. If I give you a scatter plot, and the correlation coefficient R is say 0 0.68, 0 0.68. Would that be a strong correlation or a weak correlation? Strong. Very good, it would be strong. Uh, what if R is negative 0 0.15? Weak. Weak, very good. And then the last part of the section is looking at uh, bringing in causation. So again, mostly we're worried about the correlation part. Now we want to look at causation. So um, this can be found in a box on the book in page 360, if you want to review it there. But these are possible explanations for correlations. First possible explanation is that the correlation may be a coincidence. Second is both variables might be directly influenced, um, directly influenced by some common underlying cause or causes. We could have multiple. And three, one of the uh, correlated variables might actually be the cause or one cause of the other. And again, there could be multiple causes um, for, for something, uh, in which case it might not be the only cause. Uh, so here, for, for number one, the correlation may be a coincidence. This can happen. Uh, sometimes if you have a coincidence and a correlation um, doing multiple studies, the R value will, will vary widely. That's not always the case, but um, if, if it is a coincidence, that can happen. Um, for uh, two, there might be something causing both variables to occur. So um, even though the numbers are correlated, they're related, the variables are related, uh, one doesn't cause the other, they're both caused by something else or some, some other causes, underlying cause. And then the third one, the third possibility is that one variable could in fact be causing the other variable to occur. Uh, and that's, that's where we get the, uh, the saying, uh, correlation is not causation. Because you can have a correlation between two variables where they are both being influenced by some uh, underlying 
um, event or influence and not, not directly causing the other. Okay, and that's, that's section 5E. So uh, I think we are, yeah, we're, we're out of time. So let's stop there for today. That's all of chapter five. Um, so I think next class, what we'll do is we will, um, we'll go over a little bit on how to use StackCrunch, where StackCrunch is found on the Pearson website, as well as we'll look at mini project five. Uh, and the rest of the class, we will devote to the second project. And so I guess we'll go over the second project next class. Um, yeah, that's, that's all that I had. So are there any, any questions, comments before I let you guys go? Okay. Uh, I'm not seeing any. Uh, thank you for coming again. Thank you for your patience with my uh, technology issues. <laughs> I do see a hand. Yes, question. I had a question about the histograph or histogram. Uh, histogram, yes. Yeah, when you had um, earlier showed us, so is it a that's, bar graph? Uh, yeah, so that, that's a good question. Histogram is a type of bar graph, uh, but not all bar graphs are histograms. Oh, okay. Yeah, so that's a little bit, that is a little bit confusing. Um, any other questions, comments? Okay, uh, thanks again for coming. Um, we'll, uh, we'll start this up next, next class. We'll start up the project. And uh, otherwise have a wonderful day. I will see you next class. Thank you, professor. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, let me stop the share here and stop the recording.